Let us pray. Our God and our Father, we come before you this evening. We know that the entrance of your word gives light. And by the proceeding word out of your mouth, we live. We're asking that this day, our spirits will be opened up to receive your word in Jesus' name. Amen. And we pray that the entrance of your word into every one of us will bring light which will dispel darkness from every one of our hearts. Teach us to make our lives better. Teach us to help us teach other people. Teach us so we can understand you in a better way and understand what you are doing in our day in a better way. In Jesus' name we pray. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, verses 9 to 24, is a portion for our study this evening. The work in the church is very exciting and it causes joy to all those who are involved because of the various things the Lord himself is always revealing to the seeking and searching heart. You know, there are churches where they feel that there is nothing else to learn in the Bible. And because of that, in, so, in um, so many churches, you don't find many people coming to the church meeting that features Bible study, a study of the Word of God, in-depth study, because they feel we have been in the church for such a long time and there is nothing there we're going to hear again which we have not heard before. Such people will only be Sunday, Sunday Christians. On Sunday, they'll be there, as usual, to listen to things they expected they would listen to. But then, they do not get the depths of what the Lord is teaching and what the Lord is doing. And um, some of those people actually never grow. In their conversation with the Lord, in their prayers before the Lord, in their involvement in the work of the Lord, there is no growth. But as for us, we know that whenever we are coming before the Lord and we are opening the pages of the scriptures, there is always an aspect of truth, always an area of the gospel, and always a part of the revelation of God that is new to us, that the Lord is just revealing to our hearts at the time we are studying that Bible. I have talked to you before that church work is teamwork which means you have a number of individuals getting involved in the work. In fact, the Lord wants every one of us, as we heard yesterday, to get united together, cooperate, cooperating together, and do the work. It is not a one show, a one man a show or business. It is everybody within the church, every member becoming ministers one way or the other and getting the work done. And it will need cooperation. It will need unity. It will need that your ministry will complement my ministry and mine will complement your own ministry as the church is being built. Every language you find in the New Testament used for the church, you think about the multiplicity of ministers of hands that are getting involved in the work. Jesus said, on this rock, I build my church, giving us a picture of a building. Well, only one person cannot build a building. There are many hands that get involved in having a building built. Then the Bible talks of the church as a family. Well, you know that only one person does not make up a family. And only one person, only the father, will not make up the building of the family. And as we come to think about the work related to the church. You want to understand you have a part to play. I have a part to play. But then, there should be orderliness in whatever is being done. And all this we're going to learn today as we're exposed to the ministry of Philip. And he received assistance of the apostles. He was an evangelist. But then, the apostles gave him a helping hand when it was necessary. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 8, let me read to you from verse 9. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the, 
greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles, which were Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Let's stop there. Now you can see the cooperation, the assistance that, there's, that the apostles were giving to the evangelists. Let me remind you again that in Acts of the Apostles chapter 21 verse 8, Philip was called an evangelist. And the next day, we that were Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea. And we entered into the house of Philip, the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. Now, who is an evangelist? What does an evangelist do? In what way does an evangelist minister? Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. Verse 9 and verse 10. O Zion, that bringest good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, that bringest good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. An evangelist is somebody that comes into the city, or into a town, or into a village, to people that have never heard about the good news of the gospel, and then he tells them about that good news, the love of God, the power of God, the forgiveness of God, the grace of God, and he tells them, Behold your God, mighty to save, mighty to deliver, mighty to heal. Verse 10, Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand, and his son shall rule for him, Behold, his reward is with him, his work is before him. And then, when this evangelist ministers, he preaches the gospel. He tells them the good news. They believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We say, according to the New Testament, they are converted or they are born again. And then, they become part of the church. When they become part of the church, somebody then has to continue helping them, feeding them encouraging them, maturing them. That person that continues feeding them, teaching them, encouraging them in the church is no more an evangelist, he is a pastor. And his work is in verse 11. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. So then you have seen that in the church or in the work of the Lord going on through the church we have the work of an evangelist he announces the good news he preaches or proclaims the message of salvation as the people are born again they are integrated or joined to the church and then the pastor continues and the teacher also continues teaching them but then I told you about these apostles who were the apostles how did they become apostles? And today, how do we recognize apostles? In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, Truly, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you. Now, that tells us something, that it's not every member of the church that is an apostle. It's not every person in the church that the church is sending out 
to do a particular work, carry out a particular assignment that is an apostle. It is true the word apostle, apostello in, uh, in Greek means um, somebody that is sent, but it's not everybody that is sent out with a mission from the church. It's called an apostle. An apostle has the signs of an apostle that God has given to him to, uh, to back up his ministry, the apostolic ministry. And then the apostle Paul said, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience. What are those signs? In signs and wonders and mighty deeds. True, you dis discover miracles in the life of an evangelist. And you discover wonders, healings, deliverances in the ministry of an evangelist. But then the apostolic authority is higher, is greater, is deeper. And the apostolic anointing is different from the anointing and the power and the outreach of an evangelist. What the evangelist is able to do in a limited way, the apostle is able to do in an unlimited way. In Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I'm reading verse 11. And he gave some apostles. It's not a self-imposed title that a man will give to himself. It's um, something that God himself, through Jesus Christ, bestows upon an individual. He gave some apostles. And when he gives, you'll see those signs and wonders and miracles and mighty deeds upon that individual. And he gave some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why? In verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. In um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Talking about the cooperation that goes along within the church of all the ministries. The cooperation of uh, the ministers of the gospel in the church. We find this uh, message that opens up a lot to us. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, from verse 14. For the body is not one member, but many. If the food shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it not therefore of the body? That is talking about the necessity of all the various ministries in the church to actually cooperate and get the work done and not allow a competitive spirit, a competitive attitude, not allow anyone that will say my ministry is more important than yours, not to allow anybody to say, well, because I'm not doing this, I would rather not do anything else. If the food shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? That is teaching us a great lesson. It's telling us, stay where you are. Do what you are called to do. It may not be the highest thing, the greatest thing, the loftiest thing that could be done in the church. But be what God wants you to be without trying to compete with another individual. If he has called you, being a member, uh, to carry out a particular assignment in the church, do it well and be faithful. And do not say, because I am not an apostle, or because I am not a prophet, or because I am not even an evangelist, or because I am not the pastor, or because I am not a teacher, I will not do any other thing. Be faithful. That's what the Bible is saying. And then uh, the, the building crew, the building team in the church, those who are building the church, helping in the work of the Lord, they are being told that there are various members of the body. And you'll see that some are the hands and the legs and the eyes and the nose. And others will, will just uh, have other assignments to carry out in the church. And what the word of God is saying is, do your part very well. Now, listen to me. It's not every part of the body that actually speaks out. I mean, communicating the message from the mind, from the soul, from the spirit, from the whole body, to the outside world out there. 
It's not every part of the body. But you know, every part of the body is very, very essential, very, very important. And uh, we ought to recognize that in the church. When the church does not recognize that, there is unnecessary competition, church politics, and, uh, you know, uh, unnecessary running down of uh, other people to build up our selfish, personal, private empires. Now, you don't want to do that. Because you want to do what the Lord wants you actually to do and be faithful in doing age. You know, some people say, well, the best thing in the church is that there will be no pastor, there will be no teacher, but, you know, everybody will just come together and minister together. And it, they say they call that a body ministry. That's like saying, well, hey, don't let us call uh, anyone, any part of the body mouth, any part of the body eyes, any part of the body hands. Don't let us be specific as to what an individual will do. Let everybody just come together as a body ministry. And when you come together, one of you has a psalm, one of you have a song, one of you may have a, a, an exhortation, one of you may have a word of encouragement. And when we all come together, nobody leading the meeting, nobody supervising anything, nobody pastoring over the church, nobody teaching anybody any doctrine. Let's just all come together and let just... Uh, just let us allow everybody to contribute a part without any organization. Well, you know the toe cannot speak. You know the hands cannot hear. And you know the eyes will not be able to act as your buttocks uh, to, to be able to sit down. Every part of the body, every member of the body must have its part to play. And uh, you mustn't just fold your hand and become gloomy and become angry and say, well, because I'm not so and so, because I'm not such and such, I will not do anything. Don't bury your talent. Get something done. Whatever the Lord wants you to do, get it done. And in verse 18, but now has God set members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased him. My brother, my sister, it's not by voting. You know, uh, these people that come along together and they say, well, let's, uh, let's vote for a change and let's vote for another pastor or let's vote for another co uh, coordinator let's vote for other zonal leaders and uh, let this thing be rotated around uh, so that at least uh, you are a pastor two years and another person becomes a pastor two years another person becomes past pastor two years uh, let's vote on age and that's not age you read that verse 18 again but now as God said the members, every one of them in the body, as it has pleased him. And uh, the thing that is major in the heart of the believer, the thing that should be major in the heart of the whole church is to please the Father. And whatever he's doing, whatever he's, uh, he's doing, let us allow him to do the work he's doing the way he wants it done. He has set some in the church and let's keep them set in the church and uh, this by uh, these people various churches that are saying well they don't think a pastor will be worth his salt after two years or if he's going to serve his second term after four years we need to ask them about moses who still was worth his salt after 40 years of ministry we need to ask them about Joshua, who still was worth his ministry after so many years of ministering. And we need to ask them about David, about Solomon, that re ruled in uh, Jerusalem for 40 years exactly. We need to ask them about the apostles in the New Testament, who from the time they were chosen, they were set in the church by God himself as apostles. Because it says, now God has set in the church, in the body, members, every one of them, as it has pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? That is, the church will be paralyzed. The church will be destroyed. The church will be sick if it's only the head that is functioning, if it's only a part of the body that is functioning. You heard yesterday about uh, the palsy, paralysis, four different types, as we are told. Now, it may be a part of the body that is affected, and therefore those parts are not functioning well. And now, when you are paralyzed from the neck downwards, 
When all the members of the body are not uh, functioning at all, the hands are not working, the neck will not work, the chest will not work, and even uh, the legs will not work, every other part of the body will not work except the head, that church is paralyzed. And if there is no other member that is serving in the church, and it's only the pastor, only the head that is getting the whole work done, that's paralysis in the church, and the highest kind of palsy. And so we ought to understand that the church will be receiving a healing touch, a healing power from the Lord. And every member of the body standing up and rising up to actually do the work that ought to be done. Because if we were all just pastors, where will the whole body be? If we were all just teachers, all evangelists, all prophets, all apostles, where, were they, where will be uh, the body? And so we need to understand in verse 20, but now are they many members, yet not one body? And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Now again the head to the feet, I have no need of thee. The ushers can tell the choirs, you are not important. The house fellowship leaders cannot tell the visitation workers, you are not important. The women can tell the men, you are not essential. Neither can the men tell the women in the church, you have nothing to do. We can do everything by ourselves. The old converts cannot tell the young people, the new people who are just coming to the church, you just sit down there and be learning because there is nothing for you. It says the head cannot even say to the feet, the highest cannot say to the lowest, I have no need of you. Every part of the church is very, very important in building the work of the Lord in the church. Nay, much more, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we seem to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness, for our comely parts have no need. But God has tempered the body together having given more abundant honor to that part which large, that there should be no chism or division in the body, but that the members should have the same care one of another. And whether one member suffer, all members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular, and God has set some, not everybody, some, in the church, first apostles, the highest, the greatest, the most powerful, the most authoritative, the one that binds everything together, first apostles. Second, really, prophets. Thirdly, teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healings. Those are the evangelists, helps, governments. Those are the pastors, diversities of tongues. Now, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all evangelists working miracles and having all the gifts, all the gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But covet earnestly the best gifts. Yet show I unto you a more excellent way. What does that mean? It's saying. Everybody will not be apostles, but there's an excellent way in which you can manifest your gift in the church. Everybody will not be prophets. Everybody will not be evangelists and pastors and teachers. Everybody will not be having the same office and the same ministry. But this is a more excellent way for the church to just love one another and whatever you are doing. Whatever you are doing. The more excellent way is to do it in the way of love. Because though... I speak of the tongues of men and of angels. Though I belong to the prayer warriors, and I, and I have a great work to do, if I have not charity, love, I am become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Whatever I am, whatever I have, whatever I am doing, however spiritual I appear to be, how long I may fast, how much I may pray and speak in tongues, if I do not have love, I have not discovered the more excellent way, which is for every minister, everyone combining together to build up the church. And though I have the gift of prophecy, 
because you know you may just be a prophet of the Lord and you have such a soaring a, a deep a ministry of the of prophecy and you understand all the mysteries of God and all knowledge as a teacher of the world and you have all faith as an evangelist so that I could remove mountains and have not loved charity I am nothing though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor Though as a, as a pastor, I just sit down, I'm able to counsel, I'm able to give out material things, I'm able to shepherd, I'm able to feed, I'm able to care for the poor and the needy. Though I give my body to be burned, just burn up all my energy, just I destroy my health, everything I have as I'm caring for the church as a pastor. If I do not have charity, which means love, it profits me nothing. What is that love? What is that charity? Now we all need this. As members of the church, ushers, members of the choir, prayer warriors, those who are working with the children and house fellowship leaders, those who are working with the IFL, and those who are serving in any area, in any capacity, whatever, the men and the women and the visitation leaders and the zonal leaders, area leaders and the pastor, everyone. This is all we need. You know, it doesn't matter what miracles you perform. It doesn't matter how, how, how great you are able to speak. It doesn't matter how prophetic your utterances are. It doesn't matter how you are building up the church and you are just so indispensable. If all these are not there, listen to me, you have not discovered the more excellent way. The more excellent way. That's why in this church, in this church, we have always taught that it is not the name you bear, the title you hold. It is not uh, uh, the great things you are doing. It is the love that comes out of you every time. Think about it. Uh, you know, if I could preach like I'm preaching, but then I lose my love for the people, nothing is left. And uh, if all these things are happening on Thursdays, the miracles, if there is no love for the people, we just dish out healing like, uh, the, like the vendor is dishing out newspaper, and there is no love, and there is no consideration for that other individual, you know it profits nothing. And if in the house fellowship we just teach and we minister and we're able to carry out duty as usual every Sunday, but then the more excellent way you have not discovered, it profits nobody anything. That's why it says charity suffers long. You are willing to suffer long. No matter what you are doing for the Lord. And people tread on you. People misunderstand you. People go against you. You suffer long. That's love. And it's kind. As the ushers. You wear a smile on your face. Even when you are tired. And you are almost dropping dead. And you are still kind. Charity envieth not. This is a more excellent way. And this is a profitable way. Whatever you are doing in the church, you don't envy what the other people are doing. You know God has set in the church. First, the apostles. And secondly, the prophets. And thirdly, the teachers. After that, you have the miracles and the gifts of healing and help and government and diversities of tongues. You know all are not apostles. All are not prophets. All are not teachers. All are not pastors. All are not evangelists. And there is no envy in your heart. There is no jealousy in your heart. And then it says, Charity, vaunteth not itself, is not popped up. Are you proud? In the little you're doing when you think about it everybody contributes a little a little a little a little but then drops of water make a mighty ocean you bring a block I bring a block will build the building and little grains of sand my own grain your own grain eventually you have the sand on the seashore and uh, just a bit at a time, the part you contribute and the part I contribute, that's how the church is built. And there is, no, there is no part for pride in the heart of anyone because it says charity, the love of God in the heart that has discovered the more excellent way, is not popped up, does not behave itself unseemly, is not rude, is not impolite, seeketh not her own, seeketh not her own. You know churches where, listen to me, there are some people, all they want to be in the church 
it's not like that here but all they want to be in the church is treasurer because you know if they are treasurer maybe within five years they'll be able to build a house of their own from church money seekers not her own and you know some men in the church all they want to do is have an opportunity to teach women because you know maybe if I'm in charge of the women as a man eventually I can get out of those people I can get uh, uh, somebody of my choice at least if I'm working for God there should be a reward and the only reward I'm looking for is that I'll be able to catch one of those charming ladies seekers not our own how we thank God for church a church like this but you know, in other churches, eh, they look for the place where the sin will profit them. Because if I walk in that area of the church, I'll be able to get what I want. Thank God it is not like that here. I said, thank God it is not like that here. Yeah. Or are you feeling guilty? It's like that in your heart. Now you see, charity, which has discovered the more excellent way, seeketh not our own, and it's not easily provoked. How wonderful to see ushers that will not be provoked. Members of, the, members of the choir that will not be easily provoked. How wonderful it is to see in the church, workers in the church. No matter how long they've been serving and working, no matter the provocation, no matter what the people are doing, no matter the gossip of the people who don't understand their ministry, not easily provoked. How wonderful to see a zonal leader who never gets angry. That you can tease him, you can torture him, you can gossip about him, you can run him down. Never gets angry. How wonderful to see a zonal leader, no matter how long he has been working, no matter how long he has been visiting, no matter how long he has been counseling, you never can see his eyes red or the mouth quivering with anger. But all the time just nice. No matter what anybody does in the zone, ruining the zone, wrecking the zone, um, washing everybody down, becoming rude and impolite. How wonderful to see a zonal leader who has discovered the more excellent way and will never be angry, will never be angry. You can jump on him, you can tread on him, and he'll just continue to help you without any manifestation of anger. What a wonderful church that will be. And it says, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Beareth all things. Beareth all things. You are going to take part in the building of the church. You, need to, you are going to bear all things. Because there are people who will not understand about the work of the Lord that God has placed in your hand. And uh, they will show it with their comments. They show it with their attitude because they like to just remain as it was, so it is, and so it will it ever be. I told you before, in one of the services, they were using candle before to read, electricity has come. They'll never want to use electricity. And if you use electricity in reading your own Bible, they think you are not old-fashioned enough. And you know, in this church, people have abused this church. Not unbelievers alone, even Christian people. And um, I heard information that somebody even wrote in the papers and said those people who will not allow their members to use the television, they are preaching over the television. And he doesn't uh, have any other thing to do except writing in the papers concerning that. What a great ministry the devil has given him to do. Uh, but you know, if you are a real pastor, a real child of God, and you are working for the Lord, beareth all things, all things. You just go about with a smile doing your work. You just go about preaching over the television. You just go about preaching over the radio. You just go about distributing literature. You just go about doing follow-up and visitation because you are bearing all things. It doesn't matter how they feel, what they say. The work of the Lord is going on and there is a joy of the Lord in your heart. And you know if you are going to be a pastor, maybe you are not today, but tomorrow, who knows what the Lord is preparing you for. Now, as a pastor of this church, a large church, I have to bear all things. You know that uh, sometimes you discipline people. And there are people that just feel, oh, you missed God this time. You missed God. And they feel you are backsliding. You are so hard. You are so difficult. You are so unkind. You are so unloving. And you are so unscriptural. In fact, they feel you are backsliding. You don't even know it. They feel you are not following God anymore. And while you tell them to close their eyes because you are praying, they just open their eyes and they look at you. And they look at you with a, contem a contemptible look. They say, this person that has backsliding, he doesn't know. And you know, 
uh, sometimes the pastor will hear them and we still have to keep a smile on our face joy of the Lord in our hearts because as a pastor doing something that is significant for God even when we discipline or when we preach uh, something sometimes that is hard you know we have to bear all things because those of us who don't understand today you will understand tomorrow and uh, you know we'll build a great church for you and uh, we'll build it for God maybe you don't understand today but we'll build it for you anyhow you know when the father is building a house the child may not understand why the father is away from home all the time going away to bring money to build a house the child may not understand but if that father will continue you know a time will come the father has built the house and is building that house for those children and maybe five years after ten years after those children will understand and he'll say oh we're grateful for daddy because he built a great house for every one of us children and there are sometimes members of the church like that they're just children oh no they are not backsliding they are not children of the devil they are children of god they don't just understand the pastor but they're still children of god they are born again sometimes uh, they abuse the pastor they condemn the pastor they gossip against the pastor thank god because uh, they're still born again because they think they're working for god they think they're holding on to the old standard they have been old-fashioned how we thank god he doesn't throw them into hell and you know every time they come on Thursday is still healing them even though they don't agree with all the healing going on our God is a wonderful God isn't God wonderful God is wonderful but you know maybe five years to this time they will understand that we're building a great church for them who knows some of these who don't understand they may be the people who are going to be Zona leaders tomorrow that's how God works. God is wonderful. So the pastor has to bear all things. That means endure all things. Then he believeth all things. He openeth all things. Endureth all things. And charity will never fail. Come back to Acts chapter 8. I've shown you now that whatever part of the church work you are involved in, you must understand that it's to be done in love. If you are a pastor, do it in love. If you are an evangelist, do it in love. If you are a teacher, do it in love. If you are a prophet, an apostle, do it in love. Whatever area of the work you are involved in, let love all the time fill your heart. Now, this person was driven out of Jerusalem because of persecution. I'm talking about feeling. He wasn't bitter. He wasn't bitter. He wasn't bitter. You may be persecuted. Don't let persecution destroy your ministry. Listen to me. If your love is destroyed, sooner or later, your ministry will be destroyed. Whatever you are doing, whatever you are doing, if that persecution, that opposition, that gossiping, that backbiting that people have against you, that animosity or bitterness that people have against you, if it gets at the root of your very life, because your love is the root of your life, if that thing is taken away from your heart, your ministry will soon go away. But you know, Philip was not bitter. He wasn't bitter. He wasn't saying, well, uh, they, they ran, us out, ran us out of uh, Jerusalem and those apostles, they say they have the power of God. They stayed in Jerusalem. They are not uh, coming out to obey the Lord Jesus Christ who said, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria. You know, uh, Philip did not say, I am following God. Because here am I in Samaria according to the prophetic contrast of Jesus Christ. But those foolish, selfish, uh, who cannot, uh, apostles who cannot sacrifice, who cannot serve very well, they are remaining in Jerusalem. They remain in their houses with their wives and families. They cannot work for God. They cannot endure. Philip was not like that. Because if he was like that, he would not have love. Once the love has gone, the ministry will soon go. And that's why we must be praying for all these other churches, really. Because if they do not have love for this place, thanking God for the great things the Lord is doing here, and they are bitter, and they are angry, and they are jealous, and they are envious, and there is no love, the moment they lose their love, they will soon lose their ministry. They should be careful. 
and we should be praying for them. And we should be careful here too that we do not lose our love. Love for one another and love for the people outside there. Because the moment you lose your love, your ministry will soon be lost. Now Philip came to Samaria. His heart was full of love and he remembered with delight the people of God in Jerusalem. He respected them very much. He held them in high esteem very much. No wonder the Lord was still working with him. Now in verse 9. The Lord is cautioning us to beware of sorcerers. Beware of sorcerers. In verse 9, But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. Beware. You know, in your community where you live, out there in the world there are many types of people there are many types of sinners some are just the plain plain sinners straightforward sinners oh yes they lie they commit adultery they commit fornication they're evil and the devil may be controlling them but not possessing them but you know there are other people who are just totally under the control of the evil spirits and they even have the power evil power to be able to do evil and then it says the simon having the name of an apostle but a sorcerer a wizard he was giving out that he was some great one to whom they all gave heed in that city of Samaria, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. He bewitched them with sorceries. Now, in the Bible, we're told about the activities of agents of Satan. But we're told that as believers, we shouldn't have anything, anything, to do with those evil powers in Leviticus chapter 19 verse 31 regard not them that have familiar spirits neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them I am the Lord your God regard not them that have familiar spirits what are familiar spirits Look up here, you need to understand this. Who is the familiar brother? Is uh, a brother among many brothers who is very familiar with your life, every part of your life. Who is uh, a familiar neighbor? Is a neighbor, special neighbor, among all the other neighbors who happen to be very familiar with you. He knows when you come in, when you go out. He knows how you are thinking. He knows what you are planning because he's a familiar neighbor. Who is a familiar friend? He's a friend among all other friends who happens to be very familiar with you. Very familiar with you. What is familiar spirit? Is spirit special? Among all other spirits, very, very familiar with the affairs of human beings. Familiar spirit. A spirit that, uh, you know, will just love to indwell men and women, will love to just get involved with the affairs of men and women, will like to, you know, get involved in uh, ruining and wrecking lives, and will not want to just stay in animals and stay in forests, but will like to stay, will like to be inside human beings. And people having those spirits can get into suit saying, can be familiar with the affairs of human beings. So they find that those evil spirits will just be able to give you some information about yourself if you go to their medium, if you go to the places where they are performing their magic. And you'll say, how do these people who don't even know God in the proper sense, how do they know the things that I do in my house? Well, they are familiar spirits. Spirits that are familiar with the affairs of your life. And it says, regard them not, that have familiar spirits. Run away from them. Get away from them because they are agents of Satan. And never seek after wizards to defile yourself. In Leviticus chapter 20, verse 6. And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards, to go a warring and lost him. After them, I will even cast my face against that 
so and will cut off cut him up from among his people and so you understand that the lord is warning that we shouldn't have anything to do with familiar spirits now i'm going to just stay on this point today I felt I'll be able to go through point two, point two, three, and 4, but I want to stay on this point because I want to tell you something you ought to know. As a church, as believers, as those who have the mark of the blood of Jesus Christ upon them, and you need to really pay attention tonight in what I am telling you. Now, I've told you already what familiar spirits are, what evil, these evil spirits that are very familiar with the affairs of men, and they can be in soothsayers, and uh, these spirits can, you know, tell out some information about uh, an information in the past, in your life, that uh, may be so surprising to you. If you don't know that it's a familiar spirit at work, you may think that uh, that is something wonderful, and then you defile yourself, you surrender your life, you surrender yourself totally into their hold, into their hands but you shouldn't now in um, first Samuel chapter 28 Saul a king the first king in Israel got himself modeled up because he sought after God and there was no reply God didn't answer him because of that he sought after evil spirits the spirits of witches and wizards to give him information then Saul, then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that has a familiar spirit. That has a familiar spirit. Now look up here. There are those who are possessed by evil spirits. There are those who possess evil spirits. They are different. Listen to me. Now, you have heard this um, sentence before. You may possess money, but it's a different thing when money possesses you. That is, you may hold money in your purse, in your pocket, in your hand. It's another thing if money is holding you, mastering you, controlling you. Now, if a person possesses evil spirit, that means he owes the evil spirit. He delights in that evil spirit. He holds on to that evil spirit. You know, like a witch having an evil spirit, having a familiar spirit. He doesn't want to give up. He lost that evil spirit because of the information that the evil spirit is giving to him. Therefore, um, Saul was saying, seek me a woman that has, that possesses a familiar spirit. Now, when a person possesses something and you want to take that thing out of him, or out of her, you need the cooperation of that individual. That's why when you are casting out devils, you don't just come by the same method every time. Because uh, those who are possessed by evil spirit, that is, the evil spirits holding authority over them, but they don't want the evil spirit to hold authority. They don't want it at all. They are very easy to deal with. Because all you need to deal with is with that evil spirit, and you command that evil spirit possessing that individual. But then, if it is individual possessing the evil spirit, delighting in that evil spirit, enjoying that evil spirit, wanting that evil spirit, holding on to that evil spirit, you have to convince him first that he should let loose. And then you can exercise the prayer of authority over that individual. You need to understand the difference between those things. Now, in verse 7 again, Then Saul said unto his servants, Seek me a woman that has a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that has a familiar spirit at Endor. And Saul disguised himself and put on all the raiment. And he went, and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night and, uh, and said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me him up, whom I shall name unto thee. Now, he wanted to go into what the Old Testament called necromancy. That is, getting information from the spirits of the dead. So Saul wanted to hear from Samuel, but Samuel had died. 
And so Saul went to the witch at Endor. And uh, the witch, he uh, told the witch, now, I want to talk to somebody. But the person is not among the human race anymore. The person has departed. And I want to be able to commune with the spirit so that he can tell me about uh, what I will do. Now, in verse 9. And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul has done. How he has cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore then, layest thou is near for my life to cause me to die. Look up here. Before this time, Saul had killed all people having familiar spirits. And the people having familiar spirits who were not killed, they escaped and they ran away. That was the time when Saul was still with the Lord. Because at that time the spirit of prophecy will come upon him. At that time the spirit of the Lord will come upon him. He loved God, he loved Israel, and he loved to fight the battle of the Lord. But then he allowed bitterness inside his heart. That's why I have told you, if your love is affected, you lose your ministry. And that is why you're looking up at a man here who can never allow hatred in his heart. That's why I've given you anyone the liberty to gossip, to abuse. Well, if I know about it, I'll discipline you. That's my duty as a pastor. But if I don't know about it and I just say uh, that, Pastor, they're abusing you, I just smile. Because I do not allow those things to affect my love and to affect my dedication for the work of the Lord. Because in a single week, one can lose all the power of God he has in his life. Everything. Everything. Without any trace of that power remaining in the life. And that's why it's important that as a minister of God, we keep our law as coordinators, zonal leaders, area leaders, house fellowship leaders, workers in every area. If you want to have the anointing of God upon your life, you keep the love of God. And whenever you hear that people abuse you or they gossip against you, you just smile and you, get, you go on in your way. Now, he had a trade against David. He had a trade against the other people. And he wanted even to kill, even to destroy. And you know that uh, when a person has that, the Spirit of God will leave. And the Spirit of, Lord, of the Lord left Saul. And when the Spirit of the Lord left, there was nothing else anymore. Because then he even prayed, wanting information from God. God will not give to him. And now he disguised himself. He wanted to seek after a witch or somebody having familiar spirits. And uh, when he sought one, the one at Endor, that woman said, but you know that Saul has destroyed everyone. Do you want him to destroy me if he knows I'm here? And Saul swore unto her, by the Lord. You see that? You see the contradiction? Swearing by the Lord unto a witch, saying, as the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this sin. Then said the woman, whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, bring me up Samuel. And the woman, and when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. Why? Because she had not done everything she ought to have done. She had not uh, carried out all the things and the sciences she ought to carry out. And the, the Lord just at this time. The only time that the Lord ever did it allowed uh, you know, Samuel to speak to this individual and the woman cried with a loud voice and the woman spake unto Saul saying, Why? Thou hast deceived me for thou art Saul. And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. That is, I see some people, I see some spirits, but then they are not like the one I'm familiar with. They are not the familiar spirits, but I see these as God ascending out of the earth. And he said unto her, what form is he of? And she said, an old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. But what did Samuel tell him? The judgment of God. Is due. That's the only time. Now, if the Lord is involved, is the judgment the individual will hear about death, about the doom of that individual. 
But you know, you, you shouldn't go and seek after all those uh, people having familiar spirits. What did the Lord do to Saul as a result of what he did? First Chronicles chapter 10, verse 13. So Saul died for his transgression which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of age. Because of that, he died, and inquired not of the Lord. Therefore he slew him, and turned the kingdom unto David, the son of Jesse. First Kings, chapter 22. First Kings, chapter 22, I'm reading from verse 19, and he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab? that he may go up and fall at Ramos Gilead. And one said on this manner, and another said on that manner. And there came forth a spirit, and stood before the Lord, saying, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Where are we? And he said, I will go forth, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him, and, and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord has spoken evil concerning thee. You know, Ahab was about to go for war, a battle, and he called his prophets. And he said, Prophets, what do you say? Should I go? You know there are people that want to do anything today. You want to get married? You want to get into business? You want to get something done? You go to these prophets by the seaside, these prophets that will not read the Bible, these prophets that are not born again, that are not saved, and you say, what will I do? There is a lying spirit in the mouth of every one of them. And then they will tell you something that will destroy your life. And so Ahab said, what will I do? And this evil spirit said, this is what to do. It was a lying spirit in the mouth of all those people. Now, look up here now. This is the last point I'm making tonight, and you need to understand this. I'm no more talking about the church out there. I'm talking about the church in here. What happens? In a large church like this, if a people having familiar spirits, if they come in, what will they be able to do? If a people who are witches and wizards, if they come into a church like this, what happens? What will they be able to do? Now, it's important that as you are in the church, you must be born again. Because if you are born again, there is something that happens to you. Your life is changed. Your character is transformed and the blood of Jesus Christ is, has cleansed your heart and there is the mark of that blood upon you. And God said, when I see that blood, I will pass over you. When you are born again, the mark of the blood of Jesus Christ is right there. But now, apart from the blood of Jesus being upon you as a believer, when we come together like this, and you are there sitting or standing, I am here standing up and preaching to you, or somebody is here leading choruses, or the choir is here singing, and we're here in the church. Suppose there's somebody that has evil spirit, familiar spirit, witches or wizards, suppose they come into our midst. What will they be able to do? Because in other churches, there are things that they do because of the lack of knowledge. You know the Bible says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And if you don't have understanding, if you don't have understanding, you are destroyed. Even as a church. But now, this is a gospel church, a Pentecostal church. Now, when you put those two things together, gospel and Pentecostal, the result is power, a powerful church. And now, when these uh, people having familiar spirits, when they come in, what happens to us? Or to them. 
Now listen very well now. Jesus Christ was in places with people having all types of spirits and all types of sicknesses. He never caught whatever they had. You know, nobody was able to touch Jesus and make Jesus sick. Think about it. A woman having issue of blood touched Jesus Christ. Jesus was not infected. The woman got healed. The issue of blood departed immediately. Now, when somebody having sickness or a contrary spirit touches a child of God, a member of the body of Christ, what happens? Well, exactly what happened at the time of Jesus. The body of Jesus will not catch any evil thing. It is the other one that loses the evil that he has. And I've told you before, but I didn't teach you directly like this, because on Monday it's a teaching session. And uh, you know that uh, the blind that came and touched Jesus Christ, when they touched him, he didn't become blind. But they lost their blindness. Whenever the blind touched Jesus, they lost whatever evil sin they had. Now, in the church today, what will happen? If uh, you are a believer, a child of God, I mean a real believer, you are born again, the blood of Jesus is on you. And uh, a witch... A wizard, somebody having familiar spirit comes along and he touches you. If you understand that you are a member of the body of Christ, then that person is touching Jesus Christ. He's touching the body of Christ. And if a witch touches the body of Christ, what happens? Does Jesus or the body of Christ become witch? Having evil spirit? No, as the touch of that woman stopped the issue of blood, the power of evil will stop in the life of that individual immediately. That is why if a woman is pregnant and that woman is a child of God and is covered by the blood of Jesus Christ in this assembly, now this is what I believe God for. This is what I've already settled with God. That if a person is a pregnant woman in this church, born again, a real member of the church, if a witch or a wizard will touch that individual, that pregnant woman loses nothing. It is a witch that loses something. Are you following? Yes. Now let me show you from the Bible. Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. Verse 15, in so much that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches. And at the least, that at the least, the shadow of Peter passing might overshadow some of them. And there came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits and they were healed everyone how were they healed by the shadow of peter coming upon them and so you are a believer and a witch comes around and you stand now it, it's not because uh, peter was an apostle it's just because of the power of god the anointing of god the authority of god upon his life and the shadow of peter just came on those people being vexed with evil spirits unclean spirits they lost the power of the unclean spirits now in acts chapter 19 acts chapter 19 verse 12. So that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons. So that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons. From his body, these uh, pieces of cloth were brought. And the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Now look up here. Suppose you are a child of God, or the anointing of God upon you, the power of God upon you. Not by fasting, no. Not by shouting, no. By the fact that you are born again. By the fact that the Spirit of God is within you. By the fact that the hand of the Lord has touched you. By the fact that your name is in the book of life. Now, you are wearing clothes. And you put it on the line. And um, a witch or a wizard just came along. And he stole that clothes and took it away. 
if the name of Jesus is still the same, if the power in the blood of Jesus has not failed, if the Spirit of God is still powerful, as the person is taking that clothes away, not an handkerchief, not an apron, a whole clothes that touched your body before, the body of a child of God, as he's taking it away, he will lose the power of the evil spirits. Uh, you see, uh, this is why when I go about anywhere, and uh, sometimes I see some people uh, that pull my clothes and touch me, I just uh, know that, well, if they are manifesting faith, I know that God himself will take away their sicknesses. If they are not, if they are trying to do evil, they lose the power. I have nothing to lose. If I put my handkerchief on the chair and before I come, I come there, I can't find it anymore. I just say, praise the Lord. I allow that handkerchief to go and work another miracle. They lose the power of evil. If I put my pair of shoes somewhere and before I come, I can't find it again. I say, praise the Lord. Because somebody is going to touch that sin and they're going to lose the power of evil spirits in their lives. And, uh, you know, if I'm somewhere and, uh, you know, somebody came in and just uh, rubbed me with the shoulder, uh, whatever they have in mind, whatever they have in mind, I just say, praise the Lord. The power in me will get into that individual and the evil spirits will fly away. And you know that if you will understand that and, and think like that, you can suffer no evil, no evil, no evil. And it doesn't matter whether you are closing your eyes or opening your eyes. Anybody that touches you, they are touching the power of God. And uh, anywhere we go from now, let us understand, witches and wizards and people having familiar spirits, they have nothing to do against us. The blood of Jesus is on you. The spirit of God is within you. Your name is in the book of life. You are a child of God. Even when they touch your clothes, if you believe it, it shall be so. Even when they touch your clothes, they lose their evil powers in Jesus' name. Amen. And I told you before that Jesus said, This sign shall follow them that believe in my name. In my name, they shall cast out devils. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. So whatever anybody gives you to eat, I told you before, you lay your hand on it, you call the name of Jesus, that name is more powerful than the poison they put there. And if they think you are going to die in seven days, after seven years, if Jesus tarries, you will still be around. They'll be so convicted, they'll come and join you in the church because there is nothing anybody can do against you anymore. Now please, listen to me. Moses was in the land of uh, Egypt. All those magicians, they rubbed shoulders with him. They touched him. They couldn't do any evil to him. Eventually they confessed, this is the finger of God. Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego, they were with the soothsayers, and with the Chaldeans, and with the witches, and with the wizards. They couldn't do anything against them. Eventually, they knew these people are men of God, and the Spirit of God is upon them. And uh, that woman was so saying, was following after Paul and Silas, saying, these are the men that preach unto us the way of salvation. They couldn't do anything against Paul and Silas, and in a moment, uh, Paul uh, just looked back and said, now that's Spirit, I don't want you to disturb anymore. Come out of her. And it was so immediately. And um, it's unto us according to our faith. They have never been able to do us evil. They will never be able to do us evil. Rise up and let us pray.